on this edition of Native Report. We view the celebrated artwork of sculptor Cyrus Dallin. We interview Stephen Pivar, author of The Rights of Indians and Tribes. The Congress and the courts have recognized that Indian tribes have inherent powers. And we continue to celebrate our 10th season by revisiting the Great Oak of the Pechanga Nation. We also learn something new about Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. Cyrus Dallin is regarded as one of the most important sculptors in American art. Among his most beloved works are his monuments of Native Americans. Dallin's work brings beauty and a sense of history to public spaces across the nation. Visitors to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts are greeted by the monumental bronze sculpture Appeal to the Great Spirit by American sculptor Cyrus Dolan. What may not be known to the visitors is that only miles north of here, in the community of Arlington, is a small museum devoted to the artist. Cyrus Dolan was an internationally famous sculptor who lived and worked here in the town of Arlington, Massachusetts, from about 1900 when he moved here with his wife and family until he died in 1944. And most of his major works in the United States and Europe were done while he lived here in town. Being born in Springville, Utah, that was the Wasatch Mountain area. The Native Americans that were in the area, the Utes and Paiutes, they worked on his father's silver mine. The red clay that was coming out of his father's silver mine the Native Americans saw Dallin doing figures of them, and they held him in great esteem. I mean, they knew this fella had a very wonderful talent. He had a great love of these people. He saw what was happening to them with the, Nat uh, the army and the white settlers coming across. And um, he also, there's another story that one day when he was coming from Utah back here to Boston, he uh, was on the train coming from Salt Lake, and it had to stop, I believe, in Kansas City, and it picked up a train coming down from the Dakotas, and uh, the, the Native Americans were in the cattle cars in the back of the train. Well, when Cyrus found out that Native Americans were in the cattle car, he got out of his Pullman coach and rode the rest of the way with them and found out that they were going to Washington, D.C. to complain about treaty violations. Well, he went with them and spoke to the Congressional Committee on the treaty violations and, and to give the relief to the Native Americans. So there was a great affinity with the Native Americans and Cyrus Dallin. Visitors to the museum can experience over 60 works by Cyrus Dallin that range in subject matter from historical figures to deeply personal portrayals of Native Americans, such as the ones found in this room. Now, one of his most world famous ones is the appeal of the great spirit in front of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston's Huntington Ave. In 1909, Cyrus Dallin was supposed to come up with a Native American sculpture for the Fenway area. Well, the piece that Dallin put forward for the consideration had not only the statue we see today, but it had two Native Americans standing on each side, kind of in a running position. Well, Chester French, the great sculptor uh, that did the Lincoln Memorial in, in Washington, D.C., he took a look at it and he said, Cyrus, get rid of the two standing Natives. You don't need them. This piece stands on its own. This is called the Indian Head. Now, up in New Hampshire, 
which is north of us here, um, there is a bank called the Indian Head Bank. And they commissioned Cyrus Dallin in 1929 to do three plasters and a bronze. This piece was in Nashua, New Hampshire. The bank was closed down and all the materials in it were put into storage. A fellow from Idaho purchased the locker. And when he found this, he put it on eBay for sale. Well, we saw it on eBay and made a bid for it and won the bid. When it was delivered, we received the shock. Not only was it painted orange and with the crack, which was explained uh, uh, on the uh, eBay, but on all the feathers in the back were cut off. The bank did not like it sitting out so far on the shelf, so they pushed it back by cutting off all the feathers. And we had to get that restored. Thankfully, we uh, have a restorer here not too far away from the museum who has done great work for us. He has molds of Dallin's work, so he was able to reproduce the feathers. In 1911, uh, Cyrus Dallin was contacted by the Order of Redmen down in Plymouth, Massachusetts to uh, get a sculpture of Massasoit, the chief that helped the pilgrims and the Puritans when they first arrived here in 1620. Jonathan Fairbanks, who used to be the uh, American Curator of Arts at the Museum of Fine Arts, was here for a lecture a couple of years ago at the museum. And uh, when he came in here to visit, he took one look at the Massasoit and uh, he said, you know, that is a, almost an exact copy of Michelangelo's David in Florence, Italy. The pose is almost identical. The Massasoit isn't holding a piece of cloth or something over his shoulder. Rather, he's holding a pipe instead. Dolan's sculptures are publicly displayed in the Boston area and across the United States. For the people out there in the, the West, and especially Utah, he did the Angel Moroni on top of the temple in Salt Lake City. Um, he also did the Soldiers and Sailors Monument in Syracuse, New York, which is an enormous, it's over 75 feet in the air. And uh, it's a, it's the, I guess the sculptures that on it are over 24 feet tall. I mean, it was, it's an enormous piece of work. He did the Medicine Man that's in Fairmount Park in East Philadelphia. He also did quite a bit of work around here in the town of Arlington and in the Boston area. Yeah, you, you were mentioning there's one uh, down the street. Yeah, right. Uh, it's only uh, five minutes from here, the Monotomy Hunter. We have a, a bar relief of a mother and child here in the uh, museum. Uh, it's his wife, Victoria, with their oldest son. But underneath this bar relief is a caption that says, Dear little hand, the world hath need of thee. There are wrongs to right and slaves to free. For many years, we thought here in the town of Arlington, he meant the black people. Uh, but it doesn't. It's the Native Americans. That's what he felt they were being enslaved. And so I think that taught is the, is the real essence from inside Cyrus. Did you know the word moccasin derives from a proto-Algonquin word meaning shoe? A moccasin is an article of footwear made of deer skin or other soft leather, consisting of a sole and sides made of one piece of leather stitched together at the top, and sometimes with a vamp, an additional panel of leather. The sole is soft and flexible, and the upper part often is adorned with embroidery or beading. For Indian tribes, the beadwork on moccasins is a work of utilitarian artistry. The beadwork on moccasins varies from region to region and tribe to tribe. Woodland Indians, such as the Ojibwe, often have floral patterns on their footwear. However, Indian people on the Great Plains and in the West frequently beaded more geometrical patterns. Moccasins are worn widely today in the Indian and non-Indian world.
First published in 1983, The Rights of Indians and Tribes is a popular resource in the field of federal Indian law that has sold over 100,000 copies. Author Stephen Pivar is Senior Staff Counsel for the ACLU. Tad Johnson recently sat down with Stephen to learn more. In 1971, Stephen Pivar graduated from the University of Virginia Law School and was one of 50 students to receive specialized training by the federal government. The students then went to work in legal aid offices in core poverty areas. Some people went to Harlem, New York. Uh, some people went to Indian reservations. Some people went to migrant labor areas. Uh, core poverty areas, and I won one of the fellowships and I was assigned to the, the legal aid office that had just been opened on the Rosebud Sioux Indian Reservation in South Dakota. What inspired you to write The Rights of Indians and Tribes? I lived and worked on the Rosebud Reservation for almost four years uh, as a legal aid lawyer. And during that time I gave legal assistance to hundreds of people most of whom were members of the tribe. And again, this is 1971, before courts had developed what we know today as American Indian law. There just wasn't any place that I could go to to find out what rights my clients had. And I just made a commitment that if I could get the time to do it, I would write a book. And it actually took me six years after I left to, to finally uh, finish. I was working now for the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, and the ACLU had a series of books known as the Rights Series. And uh, all of their books are in a question and answer format. So it uh, made it easy for me to select the, that same format that, uh, so that the author tries to think of every question someone might have on a topic and then answer it in the way that the average non-lawyer would be able to understand it. Stephen was in Duluth to make a presentation to the University of Minnesota Duluth's Master of Tribal Administration and Governance students. One topic dealt with the treaty making era and the infamous case of Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock. There are nearly 400 treaties between the United States government and Indian tribes. Uh, the majority of tribes have at least one treaty with the United States. Congress passed a law uh, in 1871 prohibiting further treaty making with Indian tribes, which then allowed Congress to do whatever it wanted to Indian tribes merely by passing a statute. The Lone Wolf case that you just mentioned, it's Lone Wolf versus Hitchcock, decided by the Supreme Court in 1903, is, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many tribal leaders, one of the lowest points in uh, U.S. jurisprudence, uh, court rulings. Uh, that case involved a, a treaty that had been entered into prior to 1871. Uh, this treaty was signed uh, with the United States and the Kiowas and Comanches uh, in 1867. And it guaranteed those tribes that if they um, abandoned their warfare against the United States and moved peacefully to a reservation, no additional lands would ever be taken from them unless the United States held an election for that purpose and three-fourths of the adult male members of the tribe consented to relinquishing additional portions of the reservation. Well, fa fast forward about 30 more years, uh, there's no longer any treaty making, so Congress first tried to convince the tribes to have this election and relinquish their territory, and that didn't work. So Congress passed a statute just taking nearly two million acres of land that was set aside in the treaty. The only issue facing the U.S. Supreme Court in Lone Wolf, who was one of the chiefs, and against Hitchcock, who was the Secretary of the Interior, is whether Congress has the authority to enact a statute 
that repeals or amends or abrogates an earlier treaty. And the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Congress can and does have that authority. The term usually used for uh, the power of the, of the Congress is plenary power. Yeah. And uh, there's also the concept, though, of inherent tribal sovereignty. And how do you balance those two? Uh, on the one hand, the Congress and the courts have recognized that Indian tribes have inherent powers. Uh, these aren't delegated powers. In other words, Congress doesn't uh, need to confirm uh, that an Indian tribe can marry or divorce uh, its members or determine membership. Uh, every tribe has the inherent right to do this as part of its uh, original rights. Um, however, and that's the doctrine of inherent tribal sovereignty. However, the other principle as reflected in Lone Wolf is that Congress has plenary that is full or complete authority over Indian tribes. So Indian tribes are really dependent on the goodwill of Congress or the uh, commitment that Congress has and should have to keep its word. Uh, Indians and tribes have long struggled to understand what their rights are. And in fact, there are many government officials, unfortunately, who have tried to keep that information either a secret or not disseminate it. It's often hard to find. Uh, the goal of the, of the book is to explain a very complex and complicated area of the law in the way that most people would be able to understand it. What is so special about these ponies? Well, these ponies were bred by the Boys Fort Band in northern Minnesota and also um, partly in Canada. At one time there were, um, there was a herd of over a thousand ponies and um, in the 1940s um, they didn't see any use for them. Um, actually what happened was uh, the missionaries came to the reservation and um, one of our elders said that um, they felt that it was inappropriate for the children to see horses breeding, and that was their determination to um, destroy the herd and have them sent to the meatpacking plant. And so they became extinct in the United States. There were only four left, and they were living on an island near Lac La Croix up in Canada. And one of our band members took an interest and with the Baptist minister from, from Boys Fort, they went up there and retrieved those four remaining horses and, um, and um, uh, started breeding them until they had a, um, a small herd. We always had stories and our elders always talked about the horses that they had. To celebrate our 10th season of Native Report, we are sharing stories from previous seasons. Here we go to the Pechanga Band of Lewis and New Indians and learn about the Great Oak. Estimated by some to be nearly 1,500 years old, this magnificent tree embodies the strength, wisdom, longevity, and determination of the Pechanga Band. This is known as the Great Oak to local people and the Pechanga people, and it's a, it's a coastal live oak, but it's unlike any coastal live oak in existence. It's a spirit tree, it's a person in, in our belief. On the Pechanga Reservation in Southern California is what appears to be several ordinary trees and bushes, but this is just one tree, and as you pull back the branches, and walk under the canopy, you enter a very special place. Some of the trees, like, like this one possibly, 
was uh, one of the uh, the first people, the Kabbalam, they call them. There were different things, the fog, a tree, certain rocks, and uh, they were before death came into our world. I like to say that this is one of those trees from those, this time, because this is kind of a uh, analogy would be like the Lord of the Rings type, type of world. You know, it's still, it still has its, uh, its roots in that world, and it's also staying here. As, for whatever reason, we don't know. People ask, well, how old is the tree? And we say, we don't know. Uh, coastal live oaks grow in a certain way, like even if you did those tree rings, cores or something, it, you can't really tell. Officially, we, we think it's 800 to 2,000 years old. Now, coastal live oaks, generally, they'll, they'll live to about 300 years, thereabouts. And uh, if you ask the tree expert, dendrologists and other types, it says there's no way a tree, this kind of tree could live to be you know, over 1,000 years old. But in the next sentence, they'll say, but we've never seen a tree like this either. The land the Great Oaks sits upon has a turbulent history from a treaty that was signed but never ratified and later rejected by Congress to the forced removal of the Pechanga from the valley and to the creation of the Pechanga Reservation by executive order, the one constant has been the Great Oak itself. Even when we were evicted in the 1880s and people were starving and from hunger and dying, you know, in 1882 when the, when the reservation was uh, formed by executive order, uh, it was a very cold and wet winter and people were dying. And, and yet, we didn't cut these trees down for firewood. We wouldn't do that. One of the reasons is because our tradition, trees are people and uh, they sustain us. They, uh, they helped us through drought, through famine, through uh, our eviction to this side of the valley. This tree and the, the land surrounding it is still full of that, that magic that Indians you know, believe in. In 2001, the Pechanga Tribal Council purchased the property and in 2003 had it placed into federal trust. It was their intention to preserve the tree and the surrounding land. This is one example of the cultural preservation efforts by the Pechanga Nation. We're doing a, a number of things to try to, to save our ways, our culture, our language. Like most tribes, our language is in really you know, bad shape. California tribe's been decimated, and we're a very small tribe. And uh, there's six uh, Liseno tribes, bands, and uh, Pechanga is one of them. And some of the other bands still have older people, elders that speak the language, but they're, you know, they're in their 80s now, and Liseno is their first language. And our tribe, most of our native-born speakers have gone. Yet we've developed these programs where we're instructing our children in the language and the cultural ways. When we're close to the public, we protect this area very, uh, very closely, and they have to be invited in here and be our guests. We limit it to, to 20 people at a time because of the soil compaction issues. As Dubois pointed out, the Great Oak isn't totally off limits. And for those who have been invited to visit the tree, its effect and meaning differs from individual to individual. It has a sense of uh, wisdom, it's ancient, it has a, a presence, and we've brought many people in here, and some people, they'll just start crying, you know, men and women. And other people, it won't talk to them. And we, we try to share it with our friends and, and guests if they come in a respectful way because it would be wrong to, to completely close it off because this, this is a live creature. Personally, this tree means to me that we're, we're still centered and balanced. We're still trying to keep our ways. And the Changa people have been on this land. Um, traditionally, we're known as the Pacham, the people, or Payom Kabuichim, when we're relating to other tribes, people of the West. And we've been on this land for at least 10,000 years. The, the archaeological record is 6,000 to 8,000. It keeps getting pushed further and further and further back. And so our presence is here. And if you walk among our land, uh, you'll feel that. You'll feel there's something here. This tree being here still is telling us that we're, uh, we're still centered or trying to be centered. And we're, we're being pulled in many directions with uh, 
with the Western world, uh, assimilation, acculturation, those type things. I'm an acculturated Indian, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm Pachanga Indian, but yet I grew up in the Western world. I went to Western schools, graduate school, and all of that. But when I come here, I just, it has a certain feel for me. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, find us at nativereport.org, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you for spending time with us here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. We'll see you again. Stacy Thunder is Ojibwe from the Red Lake and Lakota Ray Nations and is the Legislative Council for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Professor Ted Johnson is the Director of the Master of Tribal Administration and Governance Program at the University of Minnesota Duluth and is an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Closed captioning is provided by the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. <laughs>